Over to you, Chaz. Great. Thanks, Jill. Thank you. Uh, good morning, all. Um, just a brief introduction of my good self. Uh, my name's Chaz Goldring. Um, spent a long time in operational management, uh, primarily with, with British Steel and all its different guises, uh, and primarily in the, the uh, what we would refer to as the finishing end, the mills customer interface, the uh, the order progressing, stock management, contract management areas at, uh, at uh, British Steel. Um, I moved towards the back end of 2011 to a business excellence team that was being run by what British Steel had become, Tata. Tata had a central team that basically um, coordinated uh, lots of excellence kind of stuff, of which lean uh, improvement, continuous improvement, total quality performance, whatever you want to call it, that was part of that team. And I learned loads in that team before moving back again, back into the British Steel Reformed in 2015, 2016, becoming the improvement manager for the company in my last three years. Uh, was made, uh, was uh, no want to, longer wanted by the company back in March, so I created my own consultancy company, Goldring Lean Consulting. Um, through that time, um, I delivered all the training, I delivered all the improvements, and I learned a great deal in terms of how to develop and sustain a lean program in a what I would call a particularly difficult industry to, 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 to create that kind of culture. And I also earned my, uh, my, my badges. So I am a master black belt, a Lean Six Sigma master black belt. That's an accredited uh, master black belt with the British Quality Foundation. Um, and that came about from delivering not only three projects, each of which was worth 50,000 pound minimum, but also completing a, um, a resume that described everything I'd done within British Steel over the past three years. I always like to share the photograph on the right. Anybody, uh, and there's two young people on this this call, remember these courses, they'll remember that particular photograph. Um, I always like to, to share it because there's nothing new. Despite the grey hair, I've had grey hair since I was 25 in reality. That photograph dates from the late 1990s. There's nothing particularly new about lean tools and techniques. The difficulty with it, and we often refer to uh, to uh, the tools and techniques we teach in lean as being the hard stuff. And then we talk about some of the softer stuff, which is the behavioral stuff. I actually think we got it the wrong way around because the real difficulty in lean is not the tools and techniques. They are simple, as you can see from that photograph. The reality is actually deploying them and developing them across uh, across your, your business. What you're going to see over the next uh, 30 minutes or so is a consensus is a is a small version a much much smaller version of a leadership course that i uh, that i deliver uh, which is aimed primarily obviously at the leadership of your companies um so this is a pricey uh, it just touches upon it there are large areas that are missing uh, but hopefully it will wet your taste in terms of of lean and how we how we develop a, a lean culture so what is lean? Just as a reminder, lean is is all about focusing on the identification and elimination of waste in your processes so that all your activities essentially add value as far as the customer is concerned. Um, you're probably all aware of the little diagrammatic on the bottom, bottom left, which basically is, is about the lean principles. Lean principles is all about focusing on your customer and what the customer values from your process. The second element is to map that process, to understand the process in terms of the customer. And thirdly, it's about uh, making sure that that flow works for you by eliminating waste within the process. Fourthly, we do it at the pull of the customer. And then the fifth element is that perfection, is that, uh, is that continuous improvement, that use of PDCA, plan, do, check, act, to continually improve the way that you're operating. Some of the more visible tools of the trade in terms of lean are things like shadow boards. OK, so I love this this picture of a brush because people look at it and say, what the hell has that got to do with anything in terms of improving my process? But think about it, particularly in dirty industries, the wasted time that a guy takes to go and find the brush when he could actually be adding value as far as your process is concerned. And in reality, what happens, and got plenty of evidence over that over 
past 34 years within a heavy industrial company is that people don't bother the, the areas get dirty and that then leads to maintenance problems with all your kit because dirt gets into it. So actually these boards really, really important. Other stock tools, we have standard operating procedure. So this particular example is both a visual and a verbal aid to how to do the job. We have control boards at the point of process. So control boards are boards that summarize everything that operator needs at his point of process, where he works, in other words. So this particular board, top left is, is all the standard operating procedures behind the diagrams. The top right is all about the training. The middle row on the right is the quality, key quality issues that the operator needs to look out for. And bottom right is something called 5S, which we'll talk about uh, in a few slides time. So that's your control boards. This is your more uh, example of a visual management room. This is a war room. This is where the morning meetings take place. Indeed, in this particular case, it's both morning meetings and afternoon meetings. And it's a mix of your classic and also visual um, artificial intelligence te technology, which is showing the state of the, the particular plant at that given time. And the last photograph, this is Kanban. So this is a pool system. This is basically uh, a visual showing information, um, showing a pool of uh, material into a place governed and driven by the cars, the nice photographic cars that you can see on the uh, on the uh, on the photo there. So that's what Lean's all about. And obviously Lean, um, I'm an exponent of Lean Six Sigma, which is a further scale up. You have your continuous improvement exponents, quality exponents, people like 8D, people like A3 Thinking, et cetera, et cetera. But effectively, they're all one of the same thing. They're all about improving the way that your plant operates. So what's culture? Culture's the personality of your organization. As you sit, uh, at your uh, at your various uh, workplaces at the moment, you can probably sort of think, what is the culture of my organization? What are its ideas, its customs, its behaviors? OK, because they actually govern the way that your work gets done. OK, every organization has some form of culture and all those cultures are different. It's hard to point out. It's pervasive. It can be quite different even within a very geographically uh, uh, concentrated area. So a good example is that I live on Teesside. Uh, along the coast, there's a, um, there's a, is, uh, is a heavy engineering company that operates actually up on the, on the coastline. Within its area of work, it actually uh, has an automotive uh, company operating very, very close to it. In fact, it supplies product to that automotive pro uh, uh, company. The two companies on that one site have totally different cultures. One is very hierarchical, very uh, traditional engineering based. The other one is automotive. It is very lean. It is very, very much about improvement and an improvement culture. The point I'd make about that in terms of their cultures is that the, the people who work at those two operations both go to the same pubs in East Cleveland. They go, they live uh, side by side. They live in the same houses, et cetera, et cetera. But when they go to work, some turn right, some carry straight on. The ones who carry straight on are your lean exponents. The ones who turn right are quite a different culture. So culture is all pervading, um, really, really important. OK, culture and behavior are really important in terms of improvement. I've already described earlier on that actually the easy thing in lean thinking is the tools and techniques. It's very easy to teach somebody to do 5S, but actually to get people to use 5S is an incredibly difficult thing to do because improvement is in reality is a cultural change program. OK, it's about changing the way that they operate. But changing a culture of a company is incredibly difficult. You can liken a culture to a very, very big ship. This particular ship here, for those uh, with a historical uh, uh, background, so this is actually the good ship British Steel from the late 1970s, early 80s, when she used to carry iron ore from various plants, uh, various places in the world to back to back to the UK. I believe she's now probably uh, razor blade somewhere because a uh, long, long time since she was scrapped. But if you think of a ship of this size, it takes a considerable amount of time and energy to move its direction. Because in reality, 
if you work in a workplace and you've worked there for a considerable period of time, why do you really want to do something different? If you've been doing it for 40 years in a particular way, and as far as you're concerned, it's been quite successful, why change? Why visualise something when you know how many widgets you've produced in the last hour? What's the point of actually visualising that on a visual board? But ultimately, you as leaders and managers need to understand that knowledge is power. If you, at, in a morning, have to call up and ring up your, uh, your various work areas and ask them the question, how many widgets, how many particular stand bills, how many jobs have they got to do during the day? You are totally dependent on them at understanding what is going on. And at the end of the day, some people might fib a little bit. They might say, I've got 10 stand builds to do. In reality, they've got two because they fancy a little bit of an easy day and they don't want their managers on their backs. So like I said, knowledge is absolute power behind everything that you do. So how do you create change? Now, the model I'm going to show you, uh, there's nothing new about it. It's actually it's a McKinsey model. Uh, if you uh, uh, Google McKinsey and you look at cultural change with McKinsey, you'll find a lot more detail about this. When I started developing an improvement program within uh, my, my previous company back in 2017, um, we actually didn't realize this. We didn't really understand the McKinsey model, uh, but we actually fell naturally into creating these, these, these various, uh, these various uh, bit, bit, bits of change to change people's mindset and behavior. So there's four individual parts and what I'll do is I'll describe them quickly now and then go into some more detail against them. The first bit is all about the compelling story about your people understanding why they need to do start doing things like something called 5S when they've spent the previous 30 years not doing something called 5S. That compelling story in old aging engineering companies is quite simple. So, uh, you know, Mel and Dan on the call will recognize the right hand photograph, save our steel. It tends to concentrate people's minds. Having said that, I'd argue there's far easier compelling stories, and one is around health and safety. Health and safety and improvement are entwined in my mind. Uh, yet, in many companies, they are seen as two separate silos. Um, if you're going to make something safer, you are going to improve that process. If you're going to improve a process, then you are making it safer. So quite often, companies will use a compelling story around health and safety to launch their improvement program. They'll talk about how can we stop hurting people, you know, and that immediately gets people on board because people at the end of the day, they don't want to hurt their colleagues, their friends. You know, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to kill somebody eventually. So it tends to focus their minds. So that's the first thing. You need to make sure that this makes sense as far as your teams are concerned. The second element is all about um, reinforcement mechanisms. So this is all about that people, when they go out into their workplace, they see structures, they see processes, they see systems that support the changes that you want to make. OK, so these are things like visual boards. These are things about Kanban systems. These are things about standard operating procedures. The third element, very important, is the skills that if you've got people in your teams who don't understand why they're doing a standard operating procedure because they don't understand the theory behind it. That's really, really important that they develop an understanding of how to do it. So here we have lots and lots of uh, lovely people. In my time at uh, British Steel, I trained probably about seven, eight hundred people in the art of lean, uh, both at white and yellow belt. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So those are three of the dynamics. But believe me, they will fail if you don't have the really critical element, which is um, which is leadership, role modeling. This is about you as leaders, as managers, going out and talking the talk, okay, so that your teams see you acting differently. Let's have a look at each one in turn. So first off, compelling story. As I've said, you've got somebody on the squeaky board, you've got swords pointing at his back, uh, is he likely to do what you want to do? You know, many parts of the world, it probably works, okay? 
that certainly in more modern Western European uh, companies such as the UK, it tends to be that the people want to know why. Why do they have to do something? Where is the company heading? Why do they need to change? Why is it important to them to actually follow what you want them to do? So the compelling story is something that you and your team, your, your teams need to think about to get you guys working in the same direction. Reinforcement mechanisms. I love the thing about queuing and the Brits. OK, Brits love a bit of queuing. I Part of my course, uh, well, in pre-COVID times was all about uh, let's call them management games. But we used to play games during, during the course to make make things interesting. And one of them in particular was I expected people to 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 queue up. So what did I do? All I had to do was get two or three people to stand in a line and the rest of the group, however big that group was, would form a queue. Now, this to me is about behavior. It's about reinforcing the way that you operate. So if you have, let's call 5S, um, if you have an audit and the audit happens every morning, you've got to do it every morning, week after week, week after week, until it becomes like queuing, it becomes second nature. The people just do it. They recognize it, that it's likely to happen. So reinforcement mechanisms are all about the little things, the structures that you've got in place, the process that you've got in place, but it's all really leadership driven. OK, so let's look a little bit more at these foundations, these reinforcement mechanisms. To me, the foundations of Lean, which you need to reinforce on a daily basis, are things like 5S. There are things like the daily management, visual management, standard operating procedures, confirmation, control plans, because they're the things that drive the projects. Often with companies, I found, companies will go straight to what we refer to as either Lean Six Sigma projects or Kaizen projects without having those fundamental foundations in place. I'll give you an example. You have two shifts. Each of the two shifts works to a different standard operating procedure. If you then do an improvement project, the light chances are that improvement project will fail because the two shifts operate to two different standards in terms of the way they operate. In reality, an improvement project or a very good improvement project is actually to get that standard operating procedure written, get the best aspects for both pulled together, and you will improve the way that you operate. So not only have you got a foundation, but you're also driving improvement because improvement and the projects drive the transformation of your business. OK, so we have rocket launches. OK, what are those foundations? 5S is typically one that people quote across the lean world. This is all about your workplace being professional and well organized. OK, this is about the five. You know, obviously it's called 5S because there's five aspects to it. It is not about the it, it is not about a cleaning up operation. Often, particularly in old fashioned industries, 5S is seen as just as a good cleanup. In reality, it is bringing the lean principles to bear. It is looking at the flow of your workplace. It is reorganizing and making it work, making that system work so that there is little waste as possible. 5S then develops, and quite often companies will use 5S as their initial attack in terms of lean. That's the thing that they're going to focus on. But 5S actually interrelates with the other key element of foundations, which is your daily management routines, your visual management, your standard operating procedures and control plans and confirmations. OK, so these are all about morning meetings being visualized so everybody sees the one element of the truth. This is all about having control plans up at the points of process. 5S is often a place where people start, but often develops because they are interrelated. Uh, daily management and 5S, totally interrelated. OK, so those are your, uh, your reinforcing mechanisms. The third element are skills. Lean just doesn't happen. You need to develop your people and your skills. But often, as I found to me cost back in 1987, that's a long time ago, we a, a sheep dip approach does not always work. British Steel at the time decided everybody is going to be trained in continuous improvement. And it failed, funnily enough, because that's all they looked at. They expected magic wand that things would change. 
In reality, the strategy where you develop a hierarchy of appropriate schools works the best. So let me try and explain that to you. First off, you need to make sure that your leadership has the right training. Often, leaders will turn around and say, well, I know all about that. I'm an expert on lean. You'll be amazed that uh, probably this time last year, I was sat with the chief operating officer at British Steel and he didn't understand the word lean and he didn't understand the word waste. Often in, in lean, we forget about our senior leadership team understanding what they need to do to support the world of lean. We then go through the phases of training. So you have awareness courses where people understand what they need to do to support 5S, daily management, visual management, standard operating pro, uh, procedures. You then develop to practitioners. So these are people who lead improvement projects, who lead a 5S project, who lead a Kaizen project. You then develop through that into green belts okay so you notice i'm using lean six sigma terminology here lean six sigma turn tends to use color belts to denote the different skill factors no doubt there's similar things within 8d there's similar things within different other improvement tools and techniques um so a, a green belt becomes you are becoming more of a master practitioner because lean six sigma is very data driven it means you become a lot more knowledge in terms of statistics and then ultimately, you've got the black belts, OK? And you can see there increasing awareness in terms of the levels of training. And that training is directed at the people at those, le those levels that require it. So manufacturers like Caterpillar is a very good example of this system. Caterpillar expect everybody to, when they first join the company, to go through two or three days of awareness of how they do it the Caterpillar way. But as you work your way up, through the management systems and levels, you are then expected to go from yellow to green to black. In fact, if you go to any Caterpillar site across the world, you'll see that their management team are all black belts. They understand exactly how Lean operates and how their systems, their systems work. So how do skills support that delivery? Remember the triangle we had on the right hand side with um, with the uh, with the foundations of the base, your weight, your leadership is all encompassing. They must understand exactly what's going on at the highest level. But then it's driven. White belts is all about your 5S daily management, etc. Yellow belts do a little bit of that, but then they get into Kaizen projects. Green belts get into the more advanced stuff, and then your black belts are overseeing. Typically, a black belt will have a number of green and yellow belts all working for them who in turn will have a whole series of white belts who will be doing their uh, their improvement projects. So you can see this kind of hierarchy developing across a company. It's not a sheep dip approach. It's a very targeted approach as to who needs the skills, who needs the training. And then the fourth element is all about role modeling. This is about your leadership. Too often in the past, my experience is you have leaders who go out and they will refer to CI continuous improvement as bollocks. They'll talk about 5S as being window dressing, wallpapering exercise. So if you've got leadership talking in that language, it doesn't matter how good your compelling story is, how good your, uh, your enforcement mechanisms are, how good your skills, your training has been, it will fail because people are led by leaders and they'll do what those leaders tell them to do. And don't forget, you have your underground leaders to foster. So you have guys, people on the shop floor who are really good at this kind of thing, sort of thing, who show by their own examples how to lead um, lean and how to, to, to promote that lean culture. And role modeling is also about recognition. So here we have an assortment of photographs. These are all taken from the last year at British Steel, actually, and show two things. One is the fact that you've got various leaders in place there who are showing that they care, that they think that, you know, this is the right thing to do. And that gets promoted across the company and begins. And you get this this ball that begins roll because people want more of it. People want to have that kind of recognition. The other thing about this graphic is it also shows the, the savings that you make 
through uh, through a lean culture. Uh, so some of them quite, you know, quite high. Um, the, but the bottom two were all to do with steel making, actually, within uh, British Steel and around yield and the use of scrap, which, you know, given the volumes that we that uh, the company use, uh, used was worth a lot of money. So that's how creating change. You've got to have a compelling story. You've got to have those reinforcement mechanisms in place. You've got to have the skills. You've got to have the role modeling. Put them all to go, to, together and you can change anything. And it works. And this particular model, it doesn't just work for lean. It also works for, from, from, from a health, health and safety aspect as well. Um, so and it begins to drive that change in mindset, that change in behavior. So that's just a a resume. It's a very much a pricey of the larger leadership course. And what I do on the larger leadership course is is I get the people, the, the team themselves to decide what they want to do, how they want to direct their uh, their uh, their program of, of of improvement. But where else can we help? Um, I can um, we can help mon mentor, foster and develop your existing talent. So quite often you'll send people away on courses. Um, you know, they'll come back all motivated, etc. But then actually when they come back and they try and put it into practice, they often need somebody to talk to who's been there, who's seen it, who's done it before, who can advise them exactly what tools and techniques to use, what approaches to use and how to actually operate it. And for the younger people on this um, on this particular call, so that's you, Dan and Mel, this comes as a freebie from GLC. I don't, as I promised last March when I made my four promises of what I was going to do, one of them was I would help young people. So if you've been on a, a course in the past, one of my courses, and you are young, you get this for free. OK, so anytime you want, you just give me a ring. I can deliver, obviously, the leadership training. That's a development of what you've what you've kind of heard in, in 30 minutes. We can do that either through face to face. We can do that through Zoom, Teams, whatever you want to do, however you want to you want to call it. Uh, we can deliver bespoke lean training. So I can deliver training on daily management on 5S and deliver white belt training and I can deliver up to yellow belt training where we get into accreditation. Accreditation uh, with the BQF can be supplied with my partners. I have a lot of partners across the lean world, um, both in terms of accrediting green and black belt training and master black belt training, but also apprenticeship training to uh, from levels two all the way through to level six. Uh, I also have partners in what we refer to as the AI world, the artificial intelligence world, increasingly across lean. It's becoming more and more digitized. You have to be very careful with digitalization that you don't lose the, the 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 basic reasoning for having lean management and you don't create a monster. But I have partners who actually take you to the next uh, to the next level, particularly in terms of 5S. I have partners in the visual world. So I have people who can produce the whiteboards. I have people people who can who can advise in terms of the marking, the uh, the the painting of the floors, etc. And lastly, and probably the the, the 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 most exciting element is I have a partner uh, in the simulation world, a guy who uh, who uses a um, a piece of software called Pro Model that can take your processes and develop something that simulates different scenarios. So it's a bit like uh, anyone's uh, anyone has any knowledge, value stream mapping on steroids. So it's, a it's basically taking your process map, putting it into a computer, and then actually playing different scenarios on it, which enable you to prove whether a particular concept will work without actually having to physically do it. And that is the presentation over? So I think I've done pretty well there, Jill. Actually, thirty minutes. So there's all my contact details. Is there any questions? Everyone's been stunningly silent so far, Jill. So I haven't seen anything come through. Is there any questions that anybody would like to ask? <laughs> 